This is the Wally and Mathot Show. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Wallace. He's former NHL defenseman Mark Mathot. And to all the moms who just celebrated Mother's Day, I hope you had a great day. Meth, I'm curious, what did you do for Ellie for her Mother's Day? <laughs> Uh, I got her, um, I don't typically buy jewelry. I bought her some earrings, uh, pretty subtle and a nice card that I had the kids, um, you know, handprints sort of stenciled on. Look at uh, you. We had a night, we had a really nice dinner last night. We had a big tomahawk ribeye, uh, and some wine, Prosecco, enjoyed ourselves. Um, it was a normal COVID-19 related day <laughs> stuck in our house, but, uh, we made the best of it. See, I can... Mother's Day in our house is a little touchy now because uh, (laughs) this time of year is the NHL playoffs or it's world championships. And I'm typically on the road. So the first seven years I missed Mother's Day. Do you know how expensive that gets? Anyway, so (laughs) on the eighth one, I fly home that morning. And I remember I I just finished up a series or something. I get home. It's about 1 p.m. By about 3 p.m., I am dead asleep on the couch. I so, believe it. So that didn't go over well either. So I'm not. Yeah, I, there's so much. Yeah, but you're I need not to a dig cook, out of. right? You're not a well, cook. I, so I'm no, assuming I can did cook. you make her something last night at least? No, no, no. So I made breakfast. <laughs> I, I got up. I made a really nice oh, omelet breakfast. Congratulations. Yep. And then <laughs> I allowed she can pick whatever she wants to eat. So the, she picked, not me, poutine and pogos. Nice. Very nice. Okay, I've never well, I, I, I respect that. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, she enjoyed it. She got what she wanted. I just, it's, I'm going to have to buy our new power tool or something because I can't do the, make uh, up for all the years I've missed. Oh, fair enough. Okay. Do the kids do anything for her? Uh, yeah. They always make cards and they take care yeah. of her. And okay. so, yeah, okay. no, uh, I've always said Mother's Day is really important day because I mean, that's the hardest job I think there is in the world to do Absolutely. is being a mom. No question. <laughs> so it is it is a big day, except for the time I fell asleep on the couch. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's move on before I get myself into more trouble. That's coming up on the show. We've got lots to talk about. Of course, we've got On the Points brought to you by SportsInteraction.com. We've got the headlines brought to you by BEI. They're helping to build the Ottawa Valley. And of course, our guest today, Brandon Prust. Yes, controversial to say the least, but he's got great stories to tell. He's a former hockey teammate of meths and that is you guys won a memorial cup together back in london so we're going to talk about all those stories i know he's got lots of great things to talk about we're also going to talk about john tortorella uh but just mere hours before he decided he was going to step down when we did the interview so uh meth i it was a great interview and, and i know he's a good friend of yours yeah and i mean despite the occasional uh polarizing tweet um, you know, we have got a lot of great history together. We obviously won a championship together. He is genuinely a great person. Uh, I think that comes out a lot in the interview, hopefully. And, um, you know, otherwise, we're just grateful to have him come on with us and tell us some good old war stories from the old days in London and perhaps some of his uh, fighting experiences at the NHL level. So a lot of good stuff. That includes uh, fighting Chris Neal and, of course, that famous 2013 playoff series between Montreal and Ottawa, where he had some choice words for Paul McLean. We're going to ask him about that too. All right. Uh, still to come in the show. Oh, so we got uh, gong show trivia coming up is in trivial trivia. Another sauce off kit to give you away presented by our good friends at gongshow.com. But first, as always, Matt, let's get to the headlines built by BEI helping to build the Ottawa Valley. All right. Number one road work ahead. The league's hottest team, the Ottawa senators cooled down last night in Calgary. Year-end closeout. Who will lead the Sens in scoring? Yes, there's only one game to go in the season. Jimmy Sniper. Tim Stutzel, the youngest senator ever to record a hat trick. Forward thinking. Which senator will have more points in his career? It's multiple choice. Meth, I'll give you four guys. And let's be frank. (laughs) How about the entertainment value that Brady Kachuk brings on a nightly basis? Okay, first, road work ahead. The Ottawa Senators come in as the league's hottest team, but they get shellacked. In Calgary, six to one. It just seemed to be one of those games. A Calgary needed to win, so they're coming with all kinds of firepower. But B, at, at Ottawa just didn't seem to be in it. Yeah, and I mean, what do you expect here? They've been on a, a on a tear as of late. Obviously, playing great, really good, strong hockey, responsible hockey, and you know, coming into a back to back like this, where you're coming off a big spirited win against Winnipeg the night before, it just makes life a lot more difficult for you on that back-to-back, certainly with the travel mixed in between. So again, 
being a little biased as an ex former player here, I can say that your legs aren't going to feel great on that following night, but every team goes through it. You have to find a way to do it. But just on my thoughts, watching that game, they look flat right from the get go. Um, you know, I think with that good goal early on, Giordano makes a really nice outlet pass. He ends up going down on a breakaway. Johnny hockey naturally will probably bury that puck, which he does. I thought Victor Mete came back strong. He was trying to back check and get in there. They were wheeling pretty good. Um, but at that point, Ottawa was still kind of in it, right? You go into the yeah. intermission, you think, okay, here's an opportunity to regroup. And um, typically as a player, when you're not feeling great, that first intermission couldn't come at a better time. Um, perhaps you get an opportunity to come out, maybe draw a penalty, get a little momentum, score a goal, you're back into the game. That doesn't happen. Backlund gets that goal within the first 15 seconds of the second period, goes shelf. And I mean, to me, that would have been the turning point right there. I think that just takes all the wind out of your sails. You know, you, you, there's a little bit of breath here in life left. And then all of a sudden it gets shot down with that goal against right off the bat too. It gets rid of any potential momentum in your game. And then Calgary goes on to score a whole bunch of more goals. Aside from that one Norris goal that comes in at an opportune moment, perhaps they continue on and, and the game's over at that point. So again, to me, there's not much to talk about here other than they were flat. They didn't look good. They were bound to have a game like this. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't put too much weight into it. Not so much that. And again, we will say that Ottawa finished with its best winning road record in the last three seasons. Now they haven't had a winning road record overall on the road <laughs> since 2016, 17, but there's improvement. Yeah. Uh, yep. The one thing I noticed in last night's game, and that is it just seemed to be uh, little mistakes that prove costly. I don't know whether that's an age issue or if that was fatigue, but even if you look at the goal, I think it's the backland goal. Zub and Brandstrom are both behind the net on the same side. Yeah. Like I don't understand what happens there. Yeah, and your mind, it, you can you can try to dissect every little play out there for what it is, and obviously you can find some answers in there. But I think to me, the bigger picture is just fatigue. When you're when you're tired like that, and you're playing against a fresh team, you just you're just you're a step or two behind at any given point on the ice. And you're not always thinking straight. You're not super sharp. It doesn't matter how much coffee you drink or how many Advil cold sinuses you take before a game just to get up for it. You're still going to be, you know, a little lazy at times, a little lethargic and your decision making isn't as crisp. I've gone through that before. I know what it's like. It's incredibly frustrating. And even then on any given shift, you might be feeling pretty good, but maybe your partner's out to lunch and, and, and that costly mistake or miscue that your partner makes will affect you directly on the score sheet. So it's just one of those things where I don't want to put too much weight into this game. I don't believe it's indicative of where the team is at. They've been playing fantastic hockey lately, but you're right, Wally. You had miscues all over the ice there last night, <laughs> and you can find them in every period. It's just, yeah. it wasn't pretty. I think you just wipe it clean and move on to Toronto. Okay, well, fair enough. And let's move on to Toronto. And that is final game of the regular season. Ottawa's at home facing the provincial rival. Now, here's the thing I want to know, though. Year-end closer, we call this one, and that is who's going to lead the Sens in scoring by mm. the time that game is done. Brady Kachuk has 35 points. Norris, Batherson, Connor Brown all have 34. Give me who it is. <laughs> well, I, I like to go off the board sometimes, but in this case, I'm not doing that. I think now, <laughs> based, off, based off of Kachuk's play and how he's been held off the score sheet now on these last two games, you got to think he's just going to be chomping at the bit to come out and have a, a nice finale, if you will, in this last game against Toronto. And, and, and they're going to be rested. They've got a couple of days here to regroup, which I love. And again, the game doesn't mean a whole lot, perhaps, for the Ottawa Senators. This is almost a, a springboard for the Leafs to go in on a high note. So I think this could be a good game. You're going to have two highly yeah. motivated teams here, despite Toronto obviously not wanting to go through any injuries. That could affect their play a little bit. To me, It'll be a spirited game. They always tend to be against the Ottawa Senators. Um, but for me, back on this point, I think Kachuk's going to come out strong. I think he has to. He thrives in games like this. He's an emotional player. If it is an emotional game, you'll see the best in him come out. So I, I'm going to lean on him right now. I don't know who your answer is, Wally, but I got to go with the obvious, and it's, it's Brady Kachuk. Well, the, the question is, who does Toronto sit and not play in that game? And do they avoid oh. dressing Austin Matthews, right? They, they have nothing <laughs> to play for. And you have everything yeah. to kind of lose. I remember it was Mark Bell years ago in the final game of the regular season, takes out Alfie and either Redden or Fisher. He That's takes right. out two guys in the same game. So yeah. I'm going to well, say they're going to. If you're Sheldon Keep, what are you going to do then? Are you taking yeah. them out? I, I, I mean, 
Austin Matthews isn't going to get 50. He's not going to catch Connor McDavid any which way. He's already got 40. What else is there for him to prove? Do you want to risk him? Do you risk Mitch Marner? I don't know that they have anything to prove. I say sit them. And then, I mean, it's not like you got any fans in the stands you have to appease. All that stuff says not to dress them. And then I think I'm going to go with Connor Brown is going to finish with more points than Brady Kachuk. Only wow. he's pl- he's playing the Leafs, his former team. He's he's playing some great hockey of late. He's got sure. the heater going, and I, people forget he finished second to Brady Kachuk by one point last season in team scoring. I, yeah, I'm gonna say he just needs a two point game. Let's see. Yeah. I I'm gonna go Connor Brown. Well, on that note, and and just one more note on this topic here. I think with regards to setting your players and and that management side of of resting yeah. guys going into the postseason, I just you make a really good point. If there aren't really any personal accolades at stake, this isn't a Connor McDavid situation where, where you're trying to reach a hundred points or, or whatever it may be in, in, Austin, in Austin Matthews' case. I think you just rest those two guys right now. And I don't think they're highly motivated to go into, to go into Ottawa, excuse me, come into Canada, yeah. Ontario and play a meaningless game when they could be sitting at home watching their team on TV. Now there is a competitive side to it, perhaps, from a leadership perspective where they may want to just be in there with the guys because they don't want to leave them out hanging out to dry. But I think you got to look past all that. And if you're management, you got to take the decision out of their hands and just say, listen, you boys are sitting at home. The decision's final. We need you healthy for the postseason." And I think that's what it's going to end up being. And there's also, I mean, you look at Joe Thornton, do they say, anyway, lots of guys no, they have play. to make decisions he'll, on. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's another discussion, but yeah, you're right. All right. We'll, we'll see after Wednesday, how that all plays out. Okay. On to Jimmy sniper. 19 years old, 113 days. So 113 days after score, after playing his first NHL game, he's got his first NHL hat trick. And people were talking about him going through this struggle where I think he went uh, 30 games. He had 14 points, but just two goals. And then in his last uh, 25 games, he's got six goals, nine points. Like he's turned it around, but he wasn't playing bad hockey. He just seemed to be kind of playing on the outside a bit or there was fatigue set in. So what do you think of his game of late? Well, first thing is, I think as fans, we got to realize this kid's 19 years old. I mean, we have such a high standard for him because he came out of the gate strong. He's he's looked really good for the most part of this year. And um, I think he's playing beyond his years as far as maturity goes. So I think we kind of get lost in that. And because the group is so young, we have these unrealistic levels of expectation towards these players and and and, and expect this consistency out of them throughout the year, which it's just unfair. Right. So I think for me right now, watching his play and the way he's developed over the year and his growth, I mean, I'm, I'm more than pleased. And I think uh, if you're management, you got to try and, and especially DJ Smith, you have to try to figure out how to avoid the old infamous sophomore slump going into next year. If you can, you know, keep his mind right this year, have him make sure he has a really good, strong summer. This is almost one of the positives in having a normal summer and not having an extended playoff run only to lose at some point. I think right now, this is an advantage for these young kids. They can get stronger. They can do a lot of reviewing on their year, a lot of video. I know the coaching staff's going to send them home with, I suppose they aren't DVDs anymore, but maybe some <laughs> USB sticks with, with tons of video and clips that they've cut up that they can use to, you know, to better their game, whether it's on face-offs assignments on D zone draws, offensive zone draws, getting a good summer in the gym with their strength coach. I know Chris Schwartz will be on top of them for that. So again, back to Stutzla. I think he's had a really good year. He's, he's, he's raised the bar as far as how a rookie has to play. He was streaky, of course, almost kind of reminding me of a Mika Zibanejad, excuse me, Mika Zibanejad style player, only maybe a little more consistent, maybe a little bit uh, better at, at his age right now. So a lot of really good takeaways from this season. I've got nothing but positive uh, takes as far as Jimmy Stutzler goes. So, um, you know, stick taps to him and hopefully you can figure it out this summer, come out strong next season. Well, let me throw something out. One is he hasn't been home since he came over for world juniors, which was back in December. So it's been a long time for him just to be away from friends and family. He's 19 yeah. years old. He was 18 at the time, whatever. And then he's also played though in the German, like he's played pro hockey in the German elite league. So sure. when you, we talk about that sophomore jinx or slump, I don't see as much happening with him based on him being able to play pro so much already of his career. Yeah. So I'm going to say he's going to probably rebound. He just needs to put on some, I think some man strength. Yeah. And that's going to come right. I think yeah. like, and it's not just like all these guys work now, like when it comes to the off season, you don't really have to worry about any players slacking. 
because yeah. you come to camp and fitness testing is an absolute nightmare. I mean, it's not what it was 15 years ago. People are coming to camp in shape now, game shape. So Jimmy knows where he stands. I can't believe I'm calling him Jimmy, <laughs> but, but, but this is an opportunity for him and he knows it. I'm sure he's surrounded by good guys in the summertime that are going to push him. but you make a really good point there, Wally. And it's something I never even thought of when I was 19 years old, I was still playing in the OHL and I thought 68 games was an absolute grind. He's just, well, I guess I shouldn't say he's played an 82 game year, but he's played a compressed NHL schedule playing almost every other night. So what a learning curve for him. And now he knows where he needs to be strength wise, mentally. So it's a good opportunity for him to springboard himself next season and just have a break, another breakout season as a follow-up. So high hopes for him. You make some really good points about the homesickness thing, Wally. I think that's underappreciated. We don't talk about that enough. He's made some really good strides as an adult here. I can't wait to see what he turns into. And we're not talking like down the road from Ottawa to London. We're talking the other side of the ocean. So <laughs> across you know, the like, pond, right? Like it's a huge, it's gotta yeah. be a huge adjustment for anybody. Anyway, we'll move on. I look yeah. forward to seeing what he can do next year. Cause that's obviously sure. he set the fans of, you know, on fire here to see exactly how he's going to play out. And there's lots of excitement. So uh, we'll wait to see how next season plays out for Tim Stutzla. But I want to know now, as we look at forward thinking here, which Senator is going to finish his career with more points, Tim Stutzla, Drake Batherson, Josh Norris, or Shane Pinto. Now I will say point per game wise, they're all between like 0.59 and 0.52 or something so far in their career. And let's not forget it's a small sample size, but that's why I'm throwing this out there. I think it's fun. Who are you going to pick by the end of his career to have the most points? And there's, and I hate, I hate these questions because (laughs) they're all so young, right? So you can only make wild assumptions at this point and exactly. try to project and and it's fun. So I'm with you. I think when I'm looking at this group right now, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, I'm not going to look at their skills, their skill set, their skill level, or maybe even their scoring ability. I'm going to look at who I believe is going to have the longest career in the NHL. And even that to me is an outlandish prediction. It is very (laughs) difficult. And I hate being put on the spot and I'm still avoiding the question as we speak. So I suppose I'll just dive right into it. Yeah. I think right now, if I'm going to single out two guys, it's going to be, Jimmy Stu and Josh Norris. Okay. Right now, I think that's the obvious. I think they're two guys that are that are ahead of the game. I, I mean, in Josh Norris, if you're talking about a projected center for the next, I don't know, 12 to 15 years in the NHL at the very least, I got to think that a guy like him is just going to consistently put up a lot of points. He's going to have two legitimate line mates at all times playing around him. He's just bound to get those points at a consistent rate. Now, if we're talking about goal scoring, I think your best natural goal scorer right now is obviously Jimmy Stu. I mean, his release, the way he can play right now, although streaky as a 19-year-old, it's just too hard to predict. But if you have him moving forward with two legitimate line mates and a good centerman, maybe Shane Pinto and a guy like Connor Brown moving forward for the next at least two to three years, and he's continuing with that pace, there's an argument to be made there too. But I guess at the end of the day, I just really, really, really like um, uh, Josh Norris's play. I like how uh, responsible he plays two ways. So I'm just going to lean on him. I'm biased. I like the two way guy that can play well in his own end, almost a Bergeron type player, which is high praise, but I'm going to go with him. I think he's going to be your guy. I meant, okay. So before I get to my answer, you think Stutzla is a, and I'm, I'm, this is a serious question. You think Stutzla is a better goal scorer than Drake Batherson? See, I would have thought Batherson would have been the better goal scorer. I know, and and I get it. I'm going off the board, but I just think at his age where he's at and seeing that release that he has and some of the confidence that he comes through. And I'm a huge Batherson fan. I I love his No, no, no. I'm not downplaying that. I I just, by an NHL standard, I'm curious to your point. Yeah. Well, you have to pick one guy, right? And so when I look at these players, I'm looking at opportunity where they stand. Batherson's, I love that idea too. Don't get me wrong. And he's going to be on... He's potentially going to be a, a top line winger and, and I might be wrong and I might be eating my words in a couple of years, but I have to go off the board with at least one pick. I think Josh Norris is a safe pick. I think you're just going to get a ton of consistency out of him. So naturally I'm going to go off the board on my second. And I think it's going to be Jimmy Stu. I think as far as goal scoring goes, he's just got the release and, and he's got that X factor where every once in a while you watch him make a ridiculously confident play, almost a little too confident and I admire that at his age, at being 19, being able to possess that is intangible and you can't teach it. He's got that X factor. I'm going to go with him. I'm going to go with Josh Norris. And it, 
almost pains me to think that we're agreeing on something. Um, <laughs> I know, right? It's weird. Uh, when you said, jo I was like, <laughs> do I just pick somebody else now? Um, yeah. I, I, I just think that it, playing top line minutes and I, I, he can score and he can pass and, and he goes to those, all those greasy areas. So I think he may end up with the most points because they're probably sure. going to just bank in off of him by the end of the night. So uh, Josh Norris will be my pick, but it'll be interesting to track uh, when they're done their careers for us to be completely wrong. And it'll be Shane Pinto. So and it's, uh, and it's all about longevity, right? Like that's right. the thing here it, to me now that I've played and I've seen what it's like, it, it just, it comes down to who takes care of themselves properly. You get a little lucky. you got good genetics. Your knees don't give out on you at any given point. Those are all things that we can't quantify right now. So we got to right. leave it at that. Because they're all highly skilled. It all ends up becoming how many games do they yeah. end up actually playing. All right. Uh, finally, we'll move on to, let's be frank. And that's uh, the newest entertainment value. It has to be in the NHL is Brady Kachuk being Frank the Tank and everything else in between. Because he brings not only a strong, solid all-star type player, but you have to appreciate just being a fan of the game that he acknowledges and embraces its entertainment. Cause you don't see that all the time. You don't see Connor McDavid doing this kind of stuff or Austin Matthews for that part. Now I will give him the Joe Thornton video uh, for Patrick Marlowe was a bit entertaining, <laughs> but you don't see a lot of it on the ice. And so I appreciate yeah. everything that Brady Kachuk does to make people smile. Yeah. I mean, what, he's, he's a, he's an organizational dream, right? As far yeah. as a guy that you can market around, he's very personable. He's a, the king of highlights as far as the little little clips that they're pulling from him in the penalty box, yelling to a player across <laughs> across the ice on the bench. He fights, he scores, he hits, he gets into those dirty areas. And again, I, I can't say this enough. He just seems like a really good dude that people can get behind and cheer for. He's the kind of guy that'll sell jerseys. He brings fans into the arena. Um, so again, from, from an organization standpoint, they got to be just salivating at the fact that they have this 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 player at their disposal now in the organization representing the Ottawa Senators. So to me, he's the kind of guy that'll bring season ticket sales up. And I mean, they just got to sign him. When it comes down to it at this point, I don't know what that deal is going to look like. I'm not smart enough to be able to analyze that and bring on all these comparables, but I know that it comes down to Brady. He's got all the cards right now. And that's just, those are the facts. His brother signed, I believe, a shorter term deal with Calgary. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that's a worst case scenario if the Ottawa Senators only because it opens up options for him down the road. And it just shows that he's incredibly confident in his own play. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a credit to where he's at. He's got NHL experience in the family that I'm sure are going to be guiding him in Walt. So, I, I mean, there's a lot to stew over here and I'm sure we're going to be able to dissect this moving forward. But if you want to keep it light, high hopes for the Ottawa Senators fans. It's all good news. We're very lucky to have him in the organization. I know as a, an analyst's point of view and broadcaster's point of view, we love this because it's just a ton of sound bites that we can pull from his game. So high hopes moving forward. We'll see what happens. All right. So for the next show, you have a homework assignment. I know you know some agents in the NHL. I want you to find out what they think his contract should be for. Um, and sure. I'm putting you on the spot and now you got to answer me. So finally, I will say <laughs> when it comes, and here's the thing about Brady Kachuk is, I don't know if I can tell you a lot about the goals he scores, uh, but you know about all the stuff he's done that people were thinking of. They were reminded of laughing in the penalty box with Tim Stutzla, doing the Frank the Tank, doing rock, paper, scissors, I think, in Calgary a couple of years ago. All that stuff, talking to himself on the, the ice. Did you see Josh Norris last night said he's laughing to himself because he can hear Brady Kachuk during the anthem talking. <laughs> like You remember all of that stuff because he brings the yeah. entertainment value. And I think that that stuff to me is almost immeasurable that of how that is and what that value brings to a franchise. I, I just think they have to pay for that kind I, of value. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with that. And you make the really good point in that this is an entertainment business, right? Yeah. I mean, we, you, you want to have guys that can contest, excuse me, consistently produce, put up points and they won't always necessarily have all the theatrics behind them that, that comes with their play. But again, I mean, we can't, we can't stress this enough. This guy is the dude on the team that will sell tickets bring fans in the stands. All the kids are going to look up to him. And I mean, look, he's heart and soul. He's been fighting yeah. all year. And, and even in situations where maybe, you know, as, as a fan or a coach, you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't want you to drop him right now. Play clean, Brady. We don't want you to break those hands. But that's just who he is. He's a heart and soul type player. You got to love him. It's he's easy to cheer for. I'm just excited. I just hope they can sign him at this point. And last point, you brought up antics. 
And there are players, you know, in the league who do antics that are drive people nuts. And that's the thing I, I want to say about Brady without pumping his tires too much, but you don't get any of that stuff from him, right? You don't get the, I'll call it the Brad Marchand early days or all that stuff that would drive people nuts. And they would Tom Wilson, whatever. He just, it's clean fun, right? It's just clean yeah. entertainment fun where everybody gets into it and everybody on opposite teams and fans are like, they're still into it too. Cause they appreciate that. It's just actual kind of, he's just a good kid. So yeah. uh, to that entire family, I'll say congrats because they've raised some really good kids and their daughter is just as good. So anyway, to the Kachuk family, we, we dedicate this episode to you. Uh, all right. We'll wrap up headlines for today brought to you by Bonisher Excavating, helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Coming up after the break, we've got Brandon Prust in an interview, and it's a really good interview. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about, including torts and mother Mark Messier should be the head coach in New York and all kinds of different stuff. And of course, he gets to dish a little on his buddy, Meth, or as he's got another nickname for him. Find out coming up after the break. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show. All right, welcome back to the Wally Mathot Show. Please be joined now by nine year NHL veteran Brandon Prust. Uh, Prusty, nice to see you. Thanks for joining the show. I- I don't know how long it's been since you and Meth have talked, but you guys go a way back here. Um, is it nice to see your old buddy again? It, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's always good to see you. Trotter. Trotter always put uh, a smile on my face. We always had fun when we played together, and even when we played against each other, we'd uh, you know nice little jabs and uh, chirps here and there and stuff. But uh, yeah, we always obviously stayed uh, stay in touch. Um, but I uh, haven't uh, seen him in, in in person in a long time. That's for sure. Yeah, you're too far away. You're like six hours. What is it? Six and a half hours now to yeah. London, I think. That's yeah. always been my issue. I can't get out there. It's Unless you can get me a plane ride there, Presty. Yeah. I know you know a lot of people. Yeah, it's not like you're close like Toronto. If you're in Toronto, it'd be a little easier. But yeah, yeah. Well, you, I'm don't, just, you don't like to leave Ottawa too much. Yeah, I'm just thankful you never fought me. I never had to draw my gloves with you. So I still yeah. remember in Montreal playoffs, <laughs> After that wild game, not that I want to get into that right now, but yeah. Presty was still on the ice and had not been kicked out of the game yet. And Andy <laughs> ran out to play the puck. And like, by at this point, the benches are like cleared, like they're, everyone's gone. And I can just hear Presty coming and Andy's like 10 feet out of the net. I don't know if you remember that, Presty. And I'm was yelling it in at Ottawa? Him. Was it in, in Ottawa? Ottawa in when Ottawa. there was that line brawl at the end of the game, yes. right? And I wasn't yes. on the ice. I know. And then I'm like, I'm yelling at Presty. I'm like, Presty, please don't do this. Cause I'm like, cause if Presty runs Craig Anderson, then I'm going to have to do something and I'll probably get my face beaten in. So I'm thank you for, for being respectful. I would have, I would have fake punched hit you. Like I would have been like, <laughs> you know, like the, and then, you know, then you spin, you know, when you have, you fight, sometimes you fight like a, a friend that just, you know, in a scrum. Yeah, you, you don't want to hurt him. Like you just, just slip on a banana peel, like step on a stick, whatever, just fall down. <laughs> Well, I, we're going to have to, I guess, get right into the Montreal stuff. But just before that, when you see Meth on the other at the other end, like, is it weird to see a guy? Like, for people that don't know, you guys won a Memorial Cup together playing in London. So uh, you guys would go way back. Is it different when you're, and I guess you and like Corey Perry and all those guys, when you're facing a, a good friend that you've known for a long time? Yeah, it's, I, I, but it's fun too. I, I always look forward to it. And, uh, you know, if you're in town the night before, um, you know, you're able to go out for dinner with the guys. And uh, the thing with the NHL, it's such a kind of a small, even the hockey world in general, just a small community. So eventually you become friends with guys and then you might sign somewhere else. So you just keep building friendships as your career goes on. I, it felt like by the end of my career, I was having dinner every team I played with. The guy, <laughs> the team. Like, you know, That's you, true. Right. It's true. And, yeah, I was going to say just to touch on that, like, like, it's weird. All the guys that I won the Memorial Cup with, like, I could run into Presty in two days from now, like on the street, and I could have a full blown conversation with them and it would yeah. feel comfortable. Whereas yeah. a lot of other players that I played with that maybe I didn't win a championship with, it's almost kind of sometimes awkward, you know, at times it's not the same. But every guy that I won a championship with, it's always the same thing. I'm able to just pick things right off from where we left off. Right. It's, it's the weirdest thing. Yeah, That's yeah. Funny. Yeah, it is weird. I think that especially for us with that London Knights team, we just had such a uh, close group and uh, such a good bond. So you can go years without talking to somebody, you know, and then, but as soon as you start talking or, you know, uh, just start texting or something, it's like you, you saw each other last, last week, you know? So yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me do uh, Montreal first, then we'll go back to the London days, but since fans 
this whole entire series back in 2013, which is eight years ago to this month, was over in seven days. But it was the craziest seven days I've ever covered a playoff series. Um, and you highlighted part of it uh, with your comments about Paul McLean, um, where you called him. And I'm, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, the bug eye fat walrus. Uh, yeah. Did you ever apologize or have you ever seen Paul McLean since? I, I haven't. Um, I don't know if I really apologized. I mean, I, I don't think I publicly uh, apologized. That was a kind of a situation where, you know, the Eller hit, um, he gets taken off on a stretcher, like just face destroyed, bleeding everywhere. And, um, you know, everything was kind of between the players or whatever. And I remember after morning skate the next day or after practice the next day, I see Paul McLean's interview and he is, his interview is like, uh, you know, he, he should be mad at like number this guy for player giving, 61, like player 61 for giving him. And he goes, who was it that got hit? Like just total disrespect. And I was, and I just saw it and I'm like this. Oh my God. And then crusty media. So I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Like I went like right into media watching this interview and I just went black. Right. Just saw, just saw red. And uh, yeah, I don't even really. And then <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was a pretty good one. I when I came home for the summer, I went with my my fishing buddy, and he handed me a hat. So I got this hat that says "Bug Eyed Fat Walrus" on it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what, okay, so take me. Well, we've talked to many players on the Ottawa side, but take me into the Montreal room of that five game series. I know you lost in in five, but it was the craziest seven days I have ever covered in a series. Yeah. I mean, what else, what else happened there? Cause I've had a lot of Ottawa series in my career. So they all <laughs> sometimes like blend well, together. I think I played them five times in the playoffs, maybe. So like, I've had a, I know the, go to the, the line brawl, the line brawl. Oh, the line brawl. That was the night after the Eller hit. Was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it's the same. Was it the same? I yeah. guess I'm it was, I think I'm it's with, the next I'm game. With, I'm with Presty on this. Every time people try to like kind of bring me back to it, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just like scrambled that, eggs. It's just, it's just a, it's a yeah. blur, you know, cause you're so, you're so dialed into the series. Like yeah. people who have never played in a playoff round don't understand, but like you're so focused that sure. you just, you don't worry about all that other shit. Right. But that would have been like, Preston, you would have remembered. Was that Wally? Was that when Stoner took a slash too? Is that the micro fracture? I can't remember if that's the same series, uh, but I just remember. No, it, wasn't. it wasn't. It wasn't. I just. Rem- so did you think the Lars Eller hit was clean or dirty that you've seen now? You've well, seen the replay by Griba. Well, like back then. Yeah. I, I, if that's today, like he's going to get 20 games. Like, <laughs> back then, I mean, it was a suicide. It was a, you know, bad pass. Lar- 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 uh, Lars didn't have, you know, didn't see him coming. I, I, I mean, you know, I'm a big <laughs> advocate for hitting and, and, and open ice hits, but he, he smashed his face apart. So, I, you know, I, and that's just when they're trying to change the um, you know, that rule, like nowadays, yeah. what do you think you would get? If you said that hit happened tomorrow, what do you think you'd get? Oh, like for sure. Yeah. If it's, if it's a player that hadn't been suspended before, I'd, I'd say well, yeah, yeah, between five yeah. and 10. All right. Tom Wilson yeah. does it. Yeah. Wait, we're going to get to Tom Wilson. <laughs> we're gonna get to that. We got lots of questions. Um, <laughs> But that, so that line, bro, that's right. You're not even on the ice, but it, like yeah. everybody's squaring off. Is that, are you just chomping to get out on the ice? Yeah. I love, well, sometimes you're chomping and sometimes you're like, oh, thank God I'm not out there. I don't have to fight for this deal. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. So yeah, you, you want to get out there because it's just the, you know, the adrenaline rush and you're sitting there watching and, you know, maybe not your, your toughest guys are out there. So you want to, you know, you want to be out there to help, but I know what Trotter's thinking. I, I go out the next shift and he's, he's like, Krusty, it's over, man. It's over with. Just don't, don't do anything stupid. And it wasn't well, like, I was I, yeah, I wasn't going to go, you know, be that much of a dick and start running, running Andy over or something like that. Yeah, but I feel like you were thinking, like, and I'm not even saying this. I was probably right now. skating. I probably was skating like I was. You were the flying. Attention. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I remember it vividly. I, I remember, remember you yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rusty, no. Yeah. Oh, man. So I'm just thankful you didn't do it because, again, things were going so well for the team. The last thing I wanted was getting pumped in front of my own fans. So it worked out well. But yeah, that was a fun series. I know you guys were on the other end of it, but yeah. Man, if, <laughs> I think we, we got our revenge. Time. I think we got our revenge the next year, right? Yeah, you did. Yeah, 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 you took us out or, the, or two years after that. Anyway, it's all. 
Yeah. Yeah. They blend together. When, yeah. Especially when you retire, your brain starts going a little mushier. I, I, I got another question about a playoff series. That's you guys against the Rangers, Montreal against New York. You hit Derek step on, you got yeah. a suspension, two games, yeah. broke his jaw. Uh, did you guys ever talk after you would have been his buddy or at least you played together. Hey, uh, I don't know if you were I ta- friends. I, but- I talked to him that night. I talked to him um, that night or the next, the next morning I, I was, I was texting with him and stuff. And I mean, we, we we're going into New York down two games and um, my first shift, I'm just trying to change momentum in the series. They ran Carey Price, Carey Price is out for the season. Chris Kreider does the old accidentally on purpose. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so and just like going into my Paul McLean interview, I'm seeing red. So I'm just trying to hit everything. And it was just a little late. The hit is clean. It's just like they, I remember when I was doing the, um, I was on the phone call and they're like a late hit is 0.35 seconds. Yours was 0.55 seconds. So that's like the fraction of, of time that uh, I was, I was late on the hit. And um, I mean, he, I saw him after the series, he played the rest of the series. So I mean, he knows uh, what type of a player I am, and that I'm not uh, I'm not dirty like that. So, uh, and he was my buddy. I sat beside him for <laughs> two years in New York, like two or three, uh, two years for sure. I see he was my stallmate. So I talked to him every every day. He was one of my good buddies. So I'm not intentionally trying to to injure him, but when it comes to trying to win a playoff series and you need to change momentum, there's not much you won't do. I was even thinking of ways how to like get in Hank's kitchen and he's one of my best buddies. And I was thinking like, how am I going to clip Lundquist without getting a penalty? What am I, can I spear him? That's when I realized how deep he plays the net. Cause I kept skating around through the crease, trying to like clip him and then spear him. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I'm like, he's in his creek. Like he's in the net and I could never like, I could never get him. <laughs> That's that's some of the gamesmanship that people don't always realize, right? Like you got a lot of guys that are focused on scoring different roles throughout the lineup. And yeah. then you got guys like Presty that are your role guys that are physical. And all he's thinking is how do I get in this guy's head? How do I get in that guy's head? Change the momentum. I, I just, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Because yeah. like your goal, like the last thing I'm thinking when I was on the ice was how do I get the opposing goaltender out of his game? Right. And yeah, it's, it's a skill, man. Like you got to be good yeah. at it. So I, I, I got a lot of respect for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can you yeah, rattle? Can you rattle Henrik Lundqvist? Like knowing him, can you get in his kitchen? I don't think so. No, I've never really seen him. You can rattle him if you start burying a couple of goals on him. Yeah. That's how he'll get rattled. But the he doesn't even he doesn't even really block. I can you can rot, rattle him as a, your own teammate because I like he's so you don't talk to him like on a day of a game after morning skate like I would never even talk to him. And oh, he's one of those. We always guys. got to the rink at the same time, and I would do uh, like hot tub, cold tub, and stuff. So. I'd be, you know, in the hot tub and cold tub with him, like before every game. We never said a word. It was just I just didn't bother him. But if I would have been like, <laughs> I don't know, hey Hank, you you gonna stop him tonight? Like he might, he might go like, oh, what are you talking to me for? <laughs> oh, the, awesome. uh, so does he run that room? Like if if there was a captain for a goalie outside of Roberto Luongo when he was in Vancouver, would he have been the captain in, in New York? Just by um, leaders, just by like the presence of him, he, he's not much of um, like a talker. He wouldn't have a, a huge voice. There's not many goalies like that I've ever played with that are, you know, no. big, big talkers in the dressing room other than uh, noodles. Uh, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was the backup goalie. And uh, when I was in, when I was in Calgary, even when I got called up, I was like, geez, this backup goalie doesn't shut up. <laughs> and then I ended up getting to know him. And now it all makes sense. But yeah, Noodles is just like, I'm like, I've never heard a backup goalie behind Kipper. Like, Kipper's just sitting there with a chew in his mouth. Kipper's off. <laughs> Noodles is just, let's go, guys. We're like, just pom poms on. <laughs> oh, I love it. That guy's such a beauty. We had he's him on a few weeks ago. So many good stories. Oh, he's he just, uh, does it end. Got, he's got a lot of good stories. Yeah, uh, yeah. you so I, I meant to go back to Chris Neal and when I got sidetracked, you, I, you said on a podcast recently about uh, he's one of the toughest guys you ever fought. Like, and I think you guys, I don't know how many times it was, but it seemed like every Probably, time uh, four or five. I'd say. Where does he rank for you? Like, I, I think what, what people talk for the for the toughest guys to fight or to play against, like Chris Neal was a guy that I lined up against and battled against so much and he was a player it wasn't like he was just yeah. there 
to be a, a fighter. So when you talk like the toughest guys, like, okay, Jody, you know, Jody Shelley and Steve McIntyre and like, uh, I'm not taking saying anything that they're not uh, good players, but those guys were the, no, they had a role. Yeah. They, they had that tough, like Neeler was, you know, in power play and penalty kill. Like he was, uh, he was a leader on that team. So same with Lucic. Those are guys that were tough for me because I had to battle against those guys. There was no, uh, you know, turn back. And Neeler was, you know, he's going to punch you with, uh, either hand at any time like you're literally like like i was literally like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, like i yeah. you just knew if he if his left arm grabbed me i knew the right was coming if i did like i just that's how i fought him i'd be like okay hey, what hand is he holding on with because yeah. the other one's coming so it was like just dodge from that way <laughs> and he could eat them too like he could and take he could them like yeah. like no other right and i've made, heard him big strong like so, yeah. yeah, when they say the toughest guys that you had to fight against, like, for sure, you know, um, the Neeler and uh, Lucic, like, those guys that are logging lots of minutes and you're you're battling the corners with and you're both trying to stir the pot and we're the ones that – who who's going to – I know if I crush somebody on Ottawa, I got to fight Neeler. So, it's like, hell, <laughs> I want to fight Neeler tonight. Uh, like, in the playoffs when I hit uh, – who did I hit? I know Neeler had to come after me and – um actually it was carlson i crushed him against the boards and sure enough next actually uh there's two guys that came after me uh Kana uh, uh oh, Kanopka? Kanopka and kneeler and they're both I'm like all right well one of you I draw like two and kneeler was pushing him <laughs> off and Kanopka's pushing him off and i was like <laughs> but I, I i wanted that fight right it was playoffs it was yeah i wanted that fight so would I you just, rather between the two of them uh, and I can I fought a lot too. I probably fought him like six, six, seven times. I'd say he's just more my size. So I'd rather, I'd rather fight him. Neeler was, Neeler was pretty solid and, and, and punched hard and, and that's yeah. Yeah, good, but both really good fighters, but I had better, uh, I did better against Kanapka. So hundred, I think he had 126 NHL fights and I know you fought a ton in the AHL and that doesn't include uh postseason or preseason. Yeah. Is there, Anybody you wish you had a fought? Um, I always said I, I, I wish I fought Chara. I wish I fought. I wish I had that one under my under and and Reeves. I never played against. I think I played twice against Reeves. One time he asked me uh, in St. Louis, and we were up three nothing. And Terry and put me out. He's like, no, Presty, like don't give them any momentum. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> but I was like Reeves, he's like you got to do something. Like hit if you go hit somebody, if you you know cause a, a, a disturbance, then I have to fight you. But I'm not going to like just, you know, square off with you. Like I yeah. always told guys, if I was up and they were trying to get momentum, I'd be like, and t like, you know, entice me, like try and slash me, make a scene. Don't just go, hey, you want to fight? Because I'm going to say no. But if you like, yeah. if you make a scene where I don't want to get embarrassed, I'm going to fight you. So hold on a second. I think he's like 250, 26, something. You're 195 pounds. Does that so not weigh in? I your played game? not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's I, a huge size difference between you two. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I always, uh, but I was, uh, yeah, I was 195 played. So most guys were, I mean, even Neeler, what was Neeler? 215. Like that's. Yeah, Neeler, yeah, Neeler is like so solid. So solid. Well, like, he actually he, took, he, took good care of himself. Yeah, Steve McIntyre, when I fought him, um, I fought John Scott. So I fought him in the oh minors. Boy. Yeah, yeah, so those are, uh, I think he'd be about the same size as uh, as Charles. Yeah, he's a mutant. Yeah, so you've, you've fought <laughs> quite a few mutants then. That's yeah, true. Yeah, big, big. Uh, DJ King, you remember DJ King? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you fought DJ King too? Oh, yeah, minors. <laughs> Minor, my first year of the minors, I fought, I fought another league in fighting. And I was just going to every tough guy, every team. When like, you and I came into the league, like in the minors, at least, yeah. like our first couple of years in the American League, there was there was like legitimately two heavies on every team. Yeah, it was yeah. it was wild because because yeah. DJ King would have been in um, Peoria, Peoria, right? Yeah, and they had another guy. Who was the other guy that they Rocky had there? Thompson? Rocky yeah, Thompson. Oh. Right. like so <laughs> oh, tough, yeah. man. Oh yeah, um, I'd fight like, Rocky too. <laughs> like if you look back now, like when I look back at the teams. Like you wouldn't recognize them compared to the way they're built today. Like, like in yeah. in um, in Syracuse, we had Dorsett, Sestito, Morasti, Sugden, Kanapka. <laughs> That's a whole meat team. It's the all meat Krusty. team. Krusty was nuts. It was nuts. Like imagine, Kanopka, imagine, 
I, me having to, to play, having to no. play these guys like eight you, times you'd be a year. Like, yeah, you'd have your pick at the litter, like whoever you want. We'd be like in warm ups, like cannot like Zenon would be like grabbing water bottles like a wrestler, eh? like yeah. smashing them, spraying the fans, <laughs> like getting everyone fired. And then Morasti would be firing pucks off the glass into the opponent's zone. Like this is all in pregame warm up. It was, it was freaking wild. I couldn't believe where I was. So yeah, those those were different times. At least they were on your team. <laughs> It made yeah, it yeah, bigger with true. those guys on your team, right? Oh, dude, it was crazy. Anyway, yeah, I miss those days. That's that was the best time I think I ever had, other than in London, of course. Yeah, probably the best, the most fun I've ever had playing hockey was in the American League because, like, you know it was just yeah. my you know? first year, my first year pro in Omaha. I always say my first year pro in Omaha for some reason, just the group of guys we had, just yeah. maybe that first year pro, but. Man, I just had the most fun. I just, everyone's well, everyone's tighter, right? Like there's yeah. there weren't as many families, so like the guys are all yeah. a little younger and hanging out. Yeah. That's what a lot of players I think don't yeah. realize in the moment. And then I'm in. Then you get up to like you know the NHL, and it's like, oh, dude, this guy's got like three kids, and he's going home yeah. to his wife, yeah. and it's just different, you know. It so is. yeah, yeah. Anyway. I'm gonna assume those bus rides made a big difference, right? Because you're you long, lot, lot longer bus uh, ride than a plane I, ride. I hated, I, I hated the bus. I hated it. It's so the, the one, the one thing that in Omaha we flew everywhere. We only drove to Peoria and Iowa. Everywhere else we flew. So we would go on uh, trips. We'd go play Houston or San Antonio. It'd be a week trip. We'd be on, <laughs> we'd, be, and we'd be on that. What's that in San Antonio? They walk the the, the walk. Yeah, yeah, I forget yeah, the name of it. It's I beautiful. was there for like four days. <laughs> It was great. And then commercial flight back in the morning after you yeah. know, two games. You played oh, Thursday, dude, yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. one time jumping on the plane home and like we were all we were all hung over. We were out in San Antonio the night, the night before. <laughs> so it's like 7 a.m. flight. So everybody's just like, and uh, there was a couple open uh, first class seats, and uh, the stewardess is walking back, flight attendant. And she I was like, Hey, I'm like, do you think I can go get one of those first class seats? <laughs> Uh, and my coach is sitting across him and he just looks at me like, dirty. <laughs> sure enough, she comes back, gives me the talent. <laughs> oh, and I just walk by my coach, Ryan McGill. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> was that, was that your rookie year? My rookie year. Yeah. Oh my God. That is so bold. I wouldn't even <laughs> like, like that's the difference between Presty and me. Like, like my rookie year, I didn't say a word to anybody. I just sat there in my seat, kept my mouth shut and waited till the year to end just because we would like we had so many vets on our team, so yeah. we would get treated like yeah. garbage. Like, yeah. like that's the difference too, right? The NHL level, they don't yeah. really care if you're a rookie. Just make sure yeah. you pay for rookie party, right? Yeah. But in yeah. the A, it's more like junior, where like there's a little more hazing. It's a little old getting, school. It was a little yeah, more. Old it was school. different. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I could go on. I, I but I want to get to Tom Wilson because uh, one, yes. you you played for the Rangers, and I'm curious of your reaction if you were on the ice for the Rangers. But one. Does he get a suspension based on the way uh, that play ended? See, I, I say, I if it's not Tom Wilson, I don't think you do. I, I think the, even the lead up to it, even in front of the net, people were saying like he cross checked him, but he actually fell on top of his stick, so he didn't cross check him in the back of the net. He did punch him in the head. That was like a little Marshawn rat punch, like sure, nothing. Yes. And then Panarin's it on wasn't his a back. heavy punch. No, it wasn't a heavy punch. And then Panarin's on his back. And it, it, if you slow it down, it look, they, they keep showing it in slow motion. Any hit in slow motion looks bad. Like you slow down or anything in, in real time. Like, I don't know. It's just such a reaction. I was looking for maybe a slew foot. You guys don't think he like, it was just more of like a power move. Right. Like, I don't think yeah. yep. if it's, and then I was watching a couple of days later and Crosby got into it with somebody in the yes. corner. And I, Konecki. when I'm watching it, I'm like, that looks exactly like the Tom Wilson play. He just chucked him down. So I don't think Tom Wilson, if, it, if, if it's anybody other than Tom Wilson, uh, I don't think anybody would be making a big stink. That's for sure. And one other thing, cause I mean, you've been in these scrums, you know how they all play out. And I don't think at the time anybody cares who the person is that's jumping on your back or is trying to get at you, whether yeah. he's the league MVP yeah. or anybody. Yeah. So, but yeah. Tom Wilson doesn't drop his gloves. Yeah. And I thought that that plays a huge part of him is yeah. if it's, if you want to, you drop your gloves and pummel the guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and does he, that's, does that not show a bit of respect well, in a way? For sure. And he also, another way he showed it is when he did throw him, <laughs> throw him down and Panarin tried to get back up. He could have let him get back up, but he just held yeah. him down saying, 
listen, I don't want more shit to happen here. So just stay down. He kind of just, you know, put him, held him down, which was the smart move. He could have literally said, you want to get up and do this again? And yeah, he never took his gloves off. He, he, yeah, he violently threw him down, but Tom Wilson is a strong man. I fought him before. He is a, he's a strong boy. So, and Panera is a strong boy, but it's a different type of strength. This is old man strength type of stuff. <laughs> well, and, and, and we've been like mulling about this and it's such a polarizing topic, right? So if you're strong on one side, you're going to get attacked by the other, right? But to me, it's, and this is Wally and I had spoken about this a little too. Like he jumps on Wilson's back. Right. So yeah. the moment you do yeah. that, yeah, at least I think you are like you're fair game, yeah. right? Yeah. In a scrum, yeah. if you're gonna put yourself out there like that, and I'm not condoning all the because it optically it looks really bad, right? Like you're yes. watching the game and you're yeah. a casual fan or or you're sensitive yeah. to that stuff. Yeah. But like to me, it's like you're you're fair game if you put your hands on somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He jumped on his back. Like that's one thing. You he shouldn't have jumped on his back, like just bear hug Stand him up and behind. grab him yeah, just yes. bear hug him from behind don't jump on someone's back and then you're like then you kind of go into fight mode right so it's a different if you just come up and and grab him and kind of push him up against the boards which he you know should have done i guess like he jumped right on his back and i know I, he jumped on his back when he tom wilson was still kind of getting up or he was bent over yep. right yeah i don't know it's a tough situation but like i said if it's if it's not the tom wilson name um, I don't even think the conversation's coming up, but um, he's got the rap sheet, right? So did the Rangers organization let the team down by not having enough muscle in its lineup to begin with? And I don't uh, mean like for that game. I just mean in general. Yeah, I mean, it was, and that's that's kind of the way the league's going. Guys like Tom Wilson are the toughest guys on the ice, right? So um, the, even if you do have some tough guys, Tom Wilson in most of the games, um, he's going to be the toughest guy. I, I know when I played kind of near the end, there would be games where I would um, I would be able to kind of go out there and I'd be like, nobody's going to mess with me tonight. Like there's nobody, everybody's like scared of me. So that's the same thing with Tom Wilson. He's playing most of his games now, unless he's playing Reeves, unless he's playing like, uh, you know, San Jose's got that the tough guy. Who else are they? Gagne, yeah, yeah, in San Jose. Uh, and, uh, who yeah, else but you're right. Like, just, there's, you know, there's, there's not that much muscle anymore. So, right. but that's why you need a guy like, like Tom Wilson. And that's why, um, you know, just getting rid of Brendan Lemieux. If he's there, maybe something like that doesn't happen, right? So you get rid of that that little bit of toughness and uh, guys know that they can do whatever. I, I knew some nights so I was like, I can do whatever I want tonight. Like, those were games. If I was playing against Ottawa and Chris Neal was there, it was like, I don't own the ice. I can't really, unless I want to get in a really tough fight, I can't yeah. do exact, I can't run so, everybody. So, Preston, you, you, would agree, you would agree then that having some muscle in the lineup yeah. is a deterrence. A deterrence a lot of people, exactly. a lot of people think, well, I don't think there's room for this. Because I've had this argument with people where they just believe that there's no need for it anymore that presence in the lineup. But oh. I'm always like, man, I don't think you guys understand. Like players are more confident when they know they got a guy that has their back. Right. Okay. Look at, yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I always said when fighting, when the tough guys leave, everybody's like, Oh, fighting's not right. And concussions. I'm like, concussions are going to go up because guys are going to hit more. Like look at the playoffs. I remember watching playoffs like two years ago, guys were leaving every game with concussion because in playoffs, tough guys are, even if you are a tough guy, you don't want to take a two minute penalty. So if someone crushes somebody and you go after them, that guy's just going, okay, drop your gloves, come out. They're trying to, you don't want to take that two minutes in regular season. It's like, I don't care. I'm going to beat this guy up, but in playoffs, that's why there's so much hitting because guys know that they can get away with a lot more because guys aren't going to be, the guys can't risk right. taking, taking two minutes. That's why it always goes up in playoffs. Yeah. And, and I, I can actually agree with Presti because I'm a prime example of a very physical player that didn't like to fight. I didn't like to fight. That's just who, who I am. But in the playoffs, I would like, if I could take liberties on any of the small players that were in Montreal, yeah. for example, I would do it yeah. just because yeah. I could, you know, and I wasn't yeah. necessarily dirty, but, but I would yeah. go the extra mile to like lay a guy out or something. Right. And so, but in the regular season, I knew that I'd have to, you know, pay the piper and fight a guy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I guess, exactly. yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough topic though. Right. Like everyone, yeah, you want to find a guy like Tom Wilson that can play the game and, and be tough. And um, well, uh, where do you find I, him? You can't well, find him though. Well, we'll come out of retirement, Mark. I, I'm going to start to work out. <laughs> I'm going to start working out tomorrow. 
Um, and then I'll, I should be, I, gotta, I think I can pull out a couple more years. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Well, you just came back from a fishing trip, right? So there's no okay. more fishing trips then. It's just no beers. No, no. It's just protein shakes and training. Yeah, two protein shakes a day and uh, drinking the uh, rock, the eggs, you know, raw eggs. Yeah. Uh, lastly, before I get back to meth, because I want you to try and give me some dirt on him, we haven't been able to get any yet, is uh, John Tortorella. And I know you played very well under him. At least I think you guys got along. Uh, mm-hmm. Explain to me the coach he is. Because I think he's misunderstood, but I could be completely wrong. And two, do you think Line and Torts can work together? Now, that may be a mute point if Torts isn't the coach in Columbus at the end of this year. But do you think that Line is a type of personality that can work with John Tortorella? I don't know. I, I think he, I think he can, as long as he kind of uh, starts to understand uh, torts. It is hard when he benches you or he just kind of like says, I don't care if you're not going to play the system, you're sitting. That's hard, especially for players like that. And I think that's one thing I, well, one thing I loved about torts is because whether you made 1 million or you made 10 million, he was treating you all the same, but sometimes I'd be like, He's really going hard on Gabrick today or all the time. And Gabby doesn't really take to that. Like yell at me, like I can take it. It makes me better, but some people it doesn't make them better. So yeah. as long as line, a kind of understands torts and knows that he's going to be hard on him, And all he wants is, is effort. Like I, I love torts because he, he's so passionate and he wears his heart on his sleeve. He wants to win. He's more prepared than even any player on the team. It's like this guy's been watching game tape all night, probably didn't sleep. He's got the X's and O's down to a down to a science, the game planning and and all that. So, um, like I love his intensity, and yeah, some some guys. Um, I obviously the more skilled guys, the guys that are. You know, it's like why he didn't work in Vancouver. He went in there, tried to do military style, and they were like, no, no, this isn't going to work. Like, see, ya. Like, you can't go in to the Sedins and start, you know, pushing them around. Um, but Columbus, he's got foot soldiers, right? He yeah. needs foot soldiers. He needs guys that want to go to war, right? But can you so, win with foot soldiers? Don't you have to win with those high-skilled guys? You do. That's why. Yeah, that's why you need to. I think he's got to learn how to handle those those high the high skilled guys. Right. He's got to usually coaches adapt. They go, OK, that didn't really work there. Or like it didn't really like him and Gabby near the end. I always remember him and Gabrick were like, you know, F you match every day. I don't know if we can swear on this uh, podcast, but uh, F, yep. F you matches every day. And, you know, we're sitting in the dressing room and <laughs> And, and Gabrick's in the in the medical room, and it's pretty far away. And Torch comes in to the dressing room. He's like, "Where's Gabby? Where's Gabby?" And we're like, yeah, "He's in the medical room." And then you just hear him fucking. And like, he must have just watched the clip from the, in, in the first period or something. And Gabby's in the and you just hear, "Yeah, fuck you! No, fuck you! Fuck you!" Yeah, like it was like, and we we're all just like in the dressing room, and it's far away. And they are just screaming their heads out. Uh, like Gabby's just like, get out of my face. He's like, do your job. And oh yeah, it was, it was a shit show, but. Did I'm you sorry. ever piss off torts? Oh yeah. With turnovers. <laughs> yeah. He does not like turnovers. I remember one time, uh, I think it was my, kind of my last year and uh, maybe the start. And uh, I think I was getting maybe a little too co- comfortable, you know, and I, I, I turn over the puck uh, in the, trying to make a play coming out of the, uh, out of our zone, try to put it someone in the middle and turnover scoring chance. I get back to the bench and torch is like, I'm just sitting there like this. And he is, I can hear him screaming coming down at me and he's poking me in the shoulder. You fucking turn over the puck one more time. You're going to be pinned to this bench. And he's like, and I remember my mom, I was talking to my mom after she's like, the camera was on me the whole time. Torch just like right <laughs> beside my ear. And I'm just like this. Like I did <laughs> flinch, didn't even move, didn't even look at him. He was poking me. He was yelling at me. And I was just like, all right, I better not turn the puck over anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could have said something to him, what would that have been? I don't know. I, would he have benched you? Know. If you said something back, would he have benched you? Probably. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that's, that's, that's funny. Like some coaches, like torts would push your buttons, but you probably like, I'm assuming just by your conversation here, you couldn't bark back at him. Yeah. But guys like Ken Hitchcock, like they he'd call him. you out on the bench and you could yell back at Hitch and he'd yeah. love it. Like he'd yeah. feed off of it. Yeah. It's so strange. Eh? The dynamic, every coach yeah. is so different, but I feel like torts, 
like we had Nick Felino on and he was talking, like Nick was talking about torts and how he believes that he is kind of misunderstood and that, mm-hmm. you know, not everybody really understands how he works, but mm-hmm. like, I still, based off that conversation we had with Nick, he made it sound like, well, you know, I think you just got to understand him a little cause he's, he's yeah. pretty fair with everybody. So he's basically yeah. reiterating what you just said. And yeah. I mean, to me, it just sounds like some guys just can't handle that kind of He's intense. You know, negative energy. He's intense. I, yeah, he's intense. I've always, I've always enjoyed coaches like that. You want a passionate coach. Like the last thing you want is just a coach that's going through the motions or there's not much, you know, it's like, get, like I remember in, in Vancouver, um, we had Willie Desjardins, like, you know, great guy, but he didn't have much coaching. Like I, we lost like two or three in a row. I remember sitting beside Derek, they're sat in the dressing room. And I'm like, is he going to yell at us today? Like I wanted to come in and fucking kick a garbage can, like throw something at somebody. Like, I don't know, like just show some emotion. It was just yeah. same thing every day. And I'm like, Oh man, this sucks. <laughs> uh, would Mark Messier make a good coach in New York? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. I, 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 I mean, he's a pretty badass guy, right? I, I think he would. I've never, I don't know about his coaching or his coaching style. Like it's a tough thing to just jump, like kind of jump into, right. And start coaching, but he's, he's never coached think, anywhere. Right. He, yeah. Like, he's never coached, but you gotta think the boost is going to be a good coach, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 the coaching, it all comes down to the coaching style. I don't know how, uh, like the X's and O's. That's one thing when I retired and started going, you know, helping out with the Knights, um, just watching the Hunters, how much they work. Like I'd come in at like 8 a.m. and Dale's already on the bike and he's got the laptop in front of him. He's scouting a kid from Toronto, 16, 15 year old kid. I'm like, <laughs> Dale, like, geez, what do you, he's like, all I do is watch hockey all day. They like, yeah. So you need to have that. Like they're literally like, it's yeah. It's, it's the amount now for coaches. Like we would get to the rink, even in Dallas. I, I remember in Dallas cause I was, I was always hurt and I'd get there at like seven 30 in the morning, whatever time it was. And all coaches did was get there roughly, you know, around six 30, seven o'clock. And all they do Presty, is just cut clips. Yeah, It's so much different and worse yeah. now for coaches than it was even like oh, you know yeah. 15 years ago. Cause yeah. all they do is cut clips for yeah. like a three minute meeting and half the players at times are just tuning it out. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, and no, so yeah. like people have asked me about coaching and I'm like, no, like there's, you couldn't, you couldn't pay me enough money to do that. Cause you're literally no. at the rank more than no. anybody else in the organization. Unless you can do what Moose does and just go right to the show and just jump on that bench. <laughs> but, maybe, and the, like, but I'm not going to start, you know, the O or junior for like 50 G's like no. riding the bus, riding the bus all the time. <laughs> I'll come help. I'll come out. I'll come help for free and just yeah. I can come and go when I want. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Well, D- well, Dale didn't have a very good scouting report on you clearly. Cause you had to walk on and make it on the London nights and a golf course encounter with your dad, if I'm not mistaken, to get you to be a member of the London nights. Correct. Yeah. Well, the, the year before I went to their um, junior camp um, for um, the London nationals, the junior B team to watch me. And I had a good camp. This was like a summer camp for like their prospects. And so they invited me to main camp. Then when I went to main camp, they said, do you want to play an exhibition game? And at the time I was like, I don't think I'm going to make a team and I don't want to ruin my eligibility for scholarships. Right. So I was like, no, I'm good. So I played junior B the next year. I was like, you know what? It's not the scholarship thing. I right? like, is, isn't what it's all cracked up to be. It's be hard to get a full ride. So I was like, I, I want to play for the Knights. So um, uh, waited till about a week. Or like it was like a week before camp. I ended up a call. I'm like, man, I'm like, I thought they would want me out there. Sure enough, my I get a call at like you know four in the afternoon, a week before camp. I guess my dad was on the course. Dale, Dale, and Mark were there, and one of them. My dad says that Dale hit his ball onto his fairway. Dale says my dad hit it onto his fairway. But anyway, they ended up beating. <laughs> They ended up meeting and, and my dad was like, Hey, my son, Brandon, uh, he wants to play for you guys. He wants to try out for you guys this year. And they're like, Oh, well, we thought he was going scholarship route. And he's like, no, he, he wants to try out for you guys. <clears throat> sure enough. I got the call that day and went to camp a week later and uh, that was it. And I would made the team. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's pretty crazy. Uh, you guys end up winning a Memorial cup together. So can you give me any dirt on Mark <laughs> Mathot? Cause so far he's like Mr. <laughs> clean. I am clean. Trust me, oh, don't. Like the don't guy make goes to bed at like either. eight p.m. Don't what? Don't, don't bring make any up. bullshit up. Don't make. <laughs> you, know I mean, you know what I'm going to talk about Mexico. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long no, way no. from London. Do no. not. Nothing no. in Mexico. Nothing happened in Mexico. No, no, nothing happened. <laughs> But we had a good all trip. I, all I remember, we had a good trip. Remember, after we won the Mem Cup, after we won the Mem Cup, we uh, the, we all like 20, 25 guys, right? Uh, yeah, the whole yeah. team. And then you know, Dale, Jocko. Remember Coach Dale getting stuck out of the elevator in his underwear? Oh, yeah, hammered. Yeah, yeah. No, in no, no. Dale, Dale was in his room. Dale was in his room. I don't know if he was showering or changing, but guys were nicking in his door. I think it was bowls or something. I think it was bowling. And we're Nicky at his door, and Dale comes out and he's like, closes it. They do it again. Dale comes out <laughs> there. They do it again. Dale runs out. He's he's naked, and he runs out. And the door shuts behind him. And he's locked <laughs> out his room, so he's got to go to the room beside him. And he's knocking, and someone hands him like a hand towel. That's all they had. Was like a- <laughs> That's what it was. That's so what- he goes down to the front desk to get a towel, and everybody's we're all sitting. And we're down, all down there. Yeah. We're all down there in the lobby, and Dale's in a towel, holding it, covering his his button. <laughs> <his arm. laughs> and and uh, it was so good because Dale, like, like I was terrified. Like Dale had such a presence, right? Like we knew he liked to have fun and he liked to have the occasional beer, but like to see him like that, man, it was. <laughs> Uh, it was incredible. That was one of the one of my I, favorite trips. Oh man, I, I could go back. Yeah, I, I got I, I got some dirt on Mark, but I can't. I, I, some is uh, you can't. Some you got to take with you to the graves. So <laughs> he, uh, good I, man. I, <laughs> you guys played on a team that was I don't know whether they call it the team of the century. It was completely dominant. And when I hear you speak, uh, Brandon, I always hear you mention Corey Perry and Mark Mathot of like two of the best players. I'm like. Wait a second! This team's littered with guys. How do you get Mark Mathod in the top two? Well, I just uh, you know he. Uh, I think Mark was like one of our. Well, you know one thing about Mark. Uh, what I remember the most about him scoring two goals in Game One of the Memorial Cup uh, when we came back from three nothing. But no, I, I think like we our decor there was you know Mathod, Girardi, Severet, and you know Ryan Rodney four uh, arguably yeah. four of the top D in the league. So just that decor. But I think Mathod was just that big uh, presence. He always knew it was off the glass and out <laughs> and uh, he was very simple he was getting it out of the zone but um yeah like those guys uh you were always mark was always tough to play against and i think maybe even because i played against mark probably the most of my career him and girardi obviously I, I played with girardi but uh you know i just know how hard he is to uh, to play against so that's why he we were stand we up. were we were like we were so deep and like press Presty was like our like a role PK guy, like played tons of minutes, could score, could could fight. I, I we had I don't know how many draft picks did we have on that team, Presty? Like like ten guys, eight guys. I forget the number, but yeah, I think it was it, was, it wasn't even fair. We had Dan Fritchie, who at the time was an NHL hockey player, came yeah. down during that locker year to play with us. Yeah. Like it, we yeah. we were stacked. It was crazy. Well, I'll, I'll I'll I never came close to that. Like as far as how deep we were in comparison yeah. to the rest of the league. At any point in my career, yeah, we we were pretty much we we knew we were winning every night pretty much. It was we were pretty confident. But that third year when we won the Memorial Cup, it was it was a fun year because we were and we were just the coaches couldn't even really get a you know get mad at us for stuff. So I remember one time we're we're all out standing out lined up to go into the Jim Bob's, which is this bar. <laughs> oh, and, great bar! And, uh, and it was the night before. It was like the night before a game. And Corey, I remember. Corey Perry, his cell phone rings and uh, it's our assistant coach, Jocko. And it's like, we hear, he's like, it's Jocko. And we're like, oh my God, we're in the way. And he's like, yeah, yeah, everybody's home in bed. Yep, we're all good. Uh, I called the, I called the guys. Everybody's, everybody's good and in for curfew. And Jocko goes, oh, that's good because I can see you fuckers standing outside the bar right now. <laughs> he's over in his car. And- <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. He's like, oh, oh, shit. He's like, just don't be too late, you idiots, and like hangs up and you know. But oh, that was that amazing. Was, that yeah. was here. <laughs> they they let us get away with so much on that team, but but because we were such a good team and we were so dominant, they couldn't really say a whole lot, right? They just kind of let us go. And Prusty ran the city, like so. We were lucky in that Brandon was from London, 
and knew, and even before he played for the Knights, like he just knew everybody. So he was like our, our, li- our team liaison. So oh, I was getting everybody fake IDs, like bars set up, like golf <laughs> courses set up. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it was like a perfect storm. Having him on our team was like, he was like an agent slash player. And he hooked, <laughs> hooked, hooked the boys up with anything and whatever we needed. It was amazing. Yeah. I still remember that. Yeah. <laughs> How many guys would still keep in touch from that team? Oh, I would Quite say a few of us. Yeah, yeah, I would say I would say at least half. Yeah, I'm keeping track of some guys, um, but uh, yeah, I think we. I keep in track. I keep in touch with lots of lots of guys still from that team. I just talked to Trevor Kell the other day. Um, so yeah, just yeah, we got lots of guys that we still still keep in touch. Adam Dennis is a coach up in North Bay. So yeah. So when Dale was coaching in Washington, would you say anything to him on the bench or anything? Um, I didn't really. I just saw him after. I wouldn't. Uh, but I, he played. I we played the Capitals the, that year in the playoffs. We beat him in seven games, uh, and so Dale was. That's when Dale's year was up. So we had a pretty intense, uh, intense series. But uh, you know, a couple looks and stuff like that. But. Uh, I didn't really say too much, uh, say too much. I saw him after the game a couple times and, and chatted, but uh, Dale's pretty quiet. I let him do his thing on the bench there. I just wanted to make sure I beat him though. <laughs> do you bring, cause you went back to work for London as an assistant or associate coach. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, did you say anything or did you ever bring it up then or anything? Did you ever go yeah, back? We, yeah. 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 Cause I'm back in London now. So like I said, I just go, I'm, I'm more of a rink rat with those guys. I'm, I'm close with uh, the, the hunters and Dylan's one of my best buddies. So I'm always uh, around the rink, helping those guys out wherever I can. But uh, yeah, Dale and I have talked about, uh, I mean, that's all you do when you're, when you're with those guys, you talk hockey, like it's just hockey, hockey, talking about players, <laughs> talking about stories, just, yeah. yeah. So. Presti, a little divisive on Twitter sometimes, but let's get, let's get past all of that right now and talk about your charity in London, Presti for Kids, you're doing a lot of great work there. And you were very involved even in London when I was back in the day playing with you there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So we, uh, the Brandon Press Foundation, um, we started, my buddy and I, uh, Dave Moore, we started it uh, about 10 years ago. And we've raised almost a million dollars. Um, we also do, oh. um, so it's it's for children in need. So like every year we, we you know, we make a wish for a, ch- a child um, or every Christmas. We also started programs in London, um, the Kids Kicking Cancer Program. It's now called the Hero Circle. We get kids out of their hospital beds and they get them get them active and, you know, teach them breathing techniques. And you hear cool stories of, of kids that are doing all their treatments and getting needles every day. And, um, you know, when you hear the story of a, a kid going, you know what, the nurse asked if I wanted the numbing cream for my needle. And I said, no, I, I can take this. I can take this pain. Like, so it's stuff like that. It's pretty, uh, pretty rewarding. And we do a lot of granting as long as it deals with children in need. Um, we will grant to smaller um, charities and foundations to help them reach their goals as well. Awesome. Important work. And we really appreciate it. We know you do a lot of charity work. So uh, we know just Twitter doesn't define who you are by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, we appreciate you coming on. We uh, good luck with your charity as it continues to do lots of good work in the London area. So uh, Brandon Press, uh, happy to have you on and appreciate your time, my friend. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to see you thanks, guys. Busty. You got it, brother. Time for On the Points, brought to you by SportsInteraction.com. Sports Interaction is Canada's odds maker. Head on over to SportsInteraction.com slash Wally and Mathot today to get in on the action. Must be 19 years or older. Okay, Math Ottawa off until Wednesday when they play Toronto. So we've got a couple of other big North Division games going on tonight. And number one is the Montreal Canadiens need just one point tonight to clinch the final playoff spot in the National Hockey League. They take on the Edmonton Oilers in that Connor McDavid fella. Uh, you'd be shocked to know that Edmonton is the favorite in this one. So who do you take? I, I just, I am feeling for Montreal fans only because here we were, I think halfway through the year. And I, I think I, I was guilty of it as well. I thought they were a lock. And now, right now, they're trying to just kind of crawl their way into that postseason. So you're going to see a desperate team out of them, but they're banged up. And how do you bet against Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl with the Edmonton Oilers? You just can't. I mean, 
I know that McDavid hasn't seen a ton of success in Montreal this year point wise, but the way they've been rolling lately, I just got to go with, with their trends and they, they've, they've just been unstoppable. So I, I can't bet against them. I'm going to have to go with the Edmonton Oilers and Connor McDavid. It is. I mean, Edmonton is two, four and one against Montreal this season, but man, there's so many injuries, Carey Price and Shea Weber and Philip Deneau and no Jonathan Drew. like, they're just exactly. and Gallagher, like they're just their heart and soul has been, I guess, almost taken out of this lineup. So you wonder how that fares, but they need yeah. just one point in two games. You got to think that they're going to do it. There's no way perhaps can Calgary run the table and, and beat Vancouver four times. So that's something interesting to follow along. And I, again, Edmonton's the favorite. I will say Edmonton will likely win this game. Uh, meanwhile, Vancouver's at Winnipeg Canuck play have six more games to play this season uh they're struggling they're exhausted winnipeg still trying to obviously lock down i think third and final playoff spot or sorry the third spot in that north division uh i guess it's probably a foregone conclusion they're going to win tonight maybe yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i i don't I, I don't believe in guarantees all the time of course because hockey is such an unpredictable sport but in this case I just think Edmund, or excuse me, Winnipeg's just way too much. You know, in Vancouver, they came out strong early there, uh, right after their little COVID rebound yeah. and kind of alarmed a lot of people. We were all wondering where that play came from, but they fizzled and it's not against them. That's not an indictment against the Vancouver Canucks. I just think that schedule right now is just way too overwhelming for them. You got to go with a hungry Winnipeg team. You got to think they're going to pull through with this at this point. They're just too strong. And it's, it is interesting to watch and see how that Canuck team is just going to finish. They're just ravaged, right? And I mean, after winning three or four, after coming back, they've just, they're in a tailspin. Yeah. They just don't have any answers. So you would think Winnipeg, and rightfully so, is a favorite tonight. But man, every once in a while, though, you got to think Vancouver is just going to surprise someone. But uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe for another day. Finally, okay, there's a big game tonight. And obviously, it doesn't get the attention perhaps it deserves because we're all in the North Division. But that is... The two best teams, arguably, in the National Hockey League, or at least we think perhaps they are, uh, go head-to-head with Vegas uh, with something on the line for them tonight. Yeah, and, and, and this game should get a ton of attention because you've got two incredibly talented and deep hockey clubs that, to me, and you mentioned it, Wally, are arguably the best teams in the National Hockey League. And it's a shame that they happen to be in the same division because one's got to get eliminated, right? But in any case... You've got a really interesting matchup tonight, only because, believe it or not, there is some stuff here at stake, despite the two top teams head-to-head, in that Vegas has an opportunity right now to clinch the President's Trophy, as well as divisional title. So I I just love this matchup. I I can't wait for the series. You just got to assume they're going to meet here at some point. But I know Vegas has has had the best of Colorado throughout the year. They, they just seem to kind of come out on top here and, and obviously head to head. They're just a better team slightly, but with Colorado, they're just so unpredictable. They're a fast team. I've had discussions with guys in that division that have played against both teams. And they've always said the same thing. It's that Colorado has a ton of speed. They're reminiscent of the Detroit Red Wings years back um, when they were like just loaded with speed and skill. Yeah. And then Vegas are a little more struck, you know, structured towards, um, that heavy type of play, that postseason play where they're just a, a stronger team matchup wise and defensively. So an intriguing matchup. I still going to have to go with my Vegas Golden Knights. I'm biased. I've played for the team, of course, as you know, Wally, I've got a soft heart for them. And Mark Stone. <laughs> you did so not gonna... <laughs> play for them. <laughs> I'm going to say this every time we talk about them, <laughs> but I'm going to go with the Vegas Golden Knights. To me, they're just the better team by an edge. Uh, but there's potential here for Colorado to make some noise as well. This is a tough one to predict, but I'm going to go with the with the no-brainer in Vegas. I'm waiting for one of these days you just pop off and say, you know what, they've retired my jersey in Vegas. Um, <laughs> Vegas is looking to become the first team in the modern era so since nah, 43-44 to win a President's Trophy within its first four years of existence. So a lot on the line wow. for them. I, it's interesting to watch. I mean, the line is even. So you know how much these two teams are balanced, but I'm going to probably think that Vegas will come out just with having more on the line to try and wrap up their first president's trophy. All right. Those are the bets for today. That is on the points brought to you by sportsinteraction.com slash Wally and Mathot sports interaction. Canada's odds maker must be 19 years or older to play odds subject to change. Something else you can always bet on Craig's here. Hey, trivia time. (laughs) Yeah. You can always bet on trivia and, um, uh, we got a we got a little Napoli's gift card to give away first. So I thought we'd just 
get right into that. Let's give that one away. Um, so on Monday's show, if we rewind back to that with Dylan DeMello, we asked, uh, what nickname did Dylan get in his first game with the Winnipeg Jets? And the answer was Smoke. I didn't know that, to be honest with you. So you know who did know that? So congrats to Sakely Beast. You have just won yourself a $50 Napoli's gift card. Uh, so keep an eye on those DMs, and we're going to reach out to you shortly. Uh, speaking of nicknames, uh, Matt, uh, Brandon Press kept calling you Trotter, and I, I didn't know that was a, I didn't know that was a nickname of yours. It took me a while to kind of catch on to that. Uh, where did that one come from? So my my rookie year in London, I never really had an established nickname because coming out of minor hockey in Ottawa, no one was calling me Meth, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so once you get to junior, all of a sudden you're branded with a nickname. And uh, I think one of the uh, one of the veterans in London, I, I believe it was Ryan Hare, if I go way back, he decided to call me Matrot. Like so, Trotter kind of stuck to that only because of the way I skated. I was a little choppy or something at the time, maybe. And trotting, like as a horse, perhaps? I, yeah. I don't know. But it just stuck. It's funny. In hockey, the weirdest nicknames sometimes get thrown around. But trot stuck, so guys just started calling me Trotter. And I Trotter or Trotsky for like three years. And then I got to Columbus, and guys started calling me Crystal Meth, which then <laughs> meth stuck. So I kind of just graduated away from that. And, yeah, so so I know it's probably going to throw a curveball to some people out there when they watch the interview. And Trotter was my nickname. That's so odd that there was so much work leading up to meth seems so simple to me yet everybody. <laughs> so, but it, do you, it was, do it you was guys still in London? Do, oh, yeah. Fair enough. And everybody in London still call you Trotter. Yeah. Yeah. They still call me Trotter. Yeah. So Danny Sabret's a guy I still talk to all the time and Corey Perry occasionally when I would play against him, he'd still call me Trotter on the ice and I'd have like a double take, you know, like we'd be in Anaheim when Pears was playing for the Ducks still. And I would be going there and I'd be skating around the red line and all I'd hear is Trotter. And I'd look over and it was Pears. So uh, it's a name that has stuck with me only from the night, the Knights alumni. And that's okay. Uh, do you hate playing against uh, Corey Perry when he was in the NHL? No, I never did. I mean, I had, I had fun playing against him. I like throwing him around occasionally. Uh, but again, he was a competitive guy, nothing but respect for him. And they were hard to play against between him and Getzlaff on the same line. Could be a nightmare on some nights and Carl Carlson and I obviously experienced the ups and downs of playing against guys like that and they were uh, they were always a challenge really good on the walls use that to their advantage and um, I'm happy to see that Corey's still playing good for him all right well speaking of skilled guys like Corey Perry we got we got a little thing we can give away uh, today actually uh, we have another gong show sauce off kit to give away Ooh, uh, nice. so for today's trivia you have a chance to win your own go uh, gong show sauce off game a $250 retail value uh, perfect for the cottage road trips tailgates playing hockey in the driveway so uh, as usual a big shout out to our friends at gongshow.com and remember to check out their spring and summer collection so question for today is who did Brandon Press say he wish he had the chance to fight during his NHL career? So if you know the answer to that, uh, send us your answer on Twitter using the hashtag Wally and the thought and tag at gong show gear uh, contest closes on Wednesday, May 12th at noon. And we're going to reveal the winner on Friday show. So just a little heads up this week, uh, instead of going on Thursday, we're going to go on Friday just to maybe have a little more time to wrap up the Ottawa Senators season. Yeah, we're going to break it all down, uh, what went right, what went wrong, and have a big chat about how this team is going to look moving forward, which is obviously plenty of excitement. Uh, everybody in this city seems to be pretty excited about how this whole team is going to look moving forward. So we will break that all down. We'll bring on some guests to have a chat about that as well. So um, great show again today. I want to thank Brandon Press for stopping by. Of course, our sponsors, Bonisher Excavating, Sports Interaction, and uh, Gong Show in Naples. And remember, always shop local if you can. And uh, as always, Meth, Appreciate you and all your time. And I would probably say, you know what, Matt, that shows well done. <laughs> yeah, I had fun. Uh, unfortunately, the Sens are coming down to a, a standstill here. So we're going to have to find some playoff stuff to talk about afterwards. But lots of fun always with the both of you. Thank you very much. And one last thing I forgot, and that's Craig will shoot me for this. And that is uh, we do have some merch up for sale at shop.wallingthethought.com. Get your T-shirts. Uh, the hashtag well done <laughs> shirt is flying off store shelves. So make sure you get that in before it is gone. Anyway, uh, see you on Friday, boys.